Good evening. Um, as ever before I introduce um, Antoine Picon, I would like to thank uh, Will and also Nan in absentia, uh, Clarkson for the very special and stimulating occasion that uh, we have each year that's brought to us by the Clarkson Chair. Of course, there are two, one in architecture and one in planning, so it's in fact twice a year. Um, and so thanks to the Clarksons, we are able to host inspiring, uh, not to mention um, illustrious guests to share their labors with us and vice versa. So once again, thank you very much, uh, Will. So our guest this year, as uh, quite a few of you um, already know, um, is uh, Professor Antoine Picon. And I first met um, Antoine when he was visiting MIT from Paris, where he taught the history of architecture, urban design, and technology as uh, a professor at the Ecole Nationale des Ponts et Chaussées, a place that was made famous for architects through the career of Durand, of course, and as well as the Sorbonne, who we were, we were still teaching uh, there. And at the time, he was um, a fellow in the, at the prestigious uh, Divner Institute at MIT for the history of science and technology, which was not a place that often supported architectural projects. And I was taken by the rigor of his hybrid approach to architectural history, which is a field with a burden of its own traditions, um, as well as the history of technology, another discipline that has very strong sense of boundaries. And Antoine provided me with an example of something that I had yet myself to discover, that it was possible uh, to be a meticulous interdisciplinary historian and still work innovatively and successfully within a complex theoretical framework. Of course, Antoine uh, Picon is unique in that he has not only trained as a civil engineer, but as an architect as well, before dedicating himself to the critical project of history. He has, and for this you can just peruse his CV, which is available online, distinguished himself in all of these fields, as his many honors attest. And since his visit to MIT, he has spent more and more time in the US, first as a visiting professor at Princeton, and now as professor uh, and co-director of doctoral programs at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Antoine also continues his prominent career in France, where he still teaches at the Pont et Chaussée. So Professor Picon has an extensive corpus of publications on the relationship of architecture, urban design, science, and technology. In addition to many, many articles, he has written books on the 18th century on architects and engineers, on the contemporary urban landscape and its significance, on cyborgs, on cartography, on the relation of 19th century uh, utopian thought uh, to territorial and urban debates. And most recently, he has been focusing on digital culture and architecture, which is also the title of his most recent book. And so Antoine Picon's scholarly engagement with the 18th and the 19th century uh, uh, the history of technology and of architecture on the one hand, but also on te complex technology on the other, confirms my own belief that it's the key to understanding the development of one really lies in the other and demonstrates again and again the relevance of theoretical and historical investigations for contemporary practices. So tonight he will speak on the subject of ornament, which is the subject of a current work, uh, uh, his work in progress, uh, that will be a book soon uh, um, to be finished, to be completed. Uh, please join me in a uh, very warm welcome for our unplugged. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Will and Nan Clarkson. Thank you for making my coming possible. 
Thanks, of course, to, can you hold it, hear me? Is it on? Uh, thanks also to the School of Architecture and Planning, to Hadas, who's interrupted a sabbatical to drive me around Buffalo and make me discover all kinds of wonderful things from silos to Frank Lloyd Wright buildings, uh, and not to mention uh, Skyscraper by Sullivan. So thank you very much, Hadas, and thank you, Kenny, also, to have taken me out today. So, as Hadas mentioned, what I'm going to present is actually what I'm currently working on, which is a small book. What, one of the advantages that I have in English is that I cannot write very long books. So, so I write small things, so it's, it's a, supposed to be a small essay on ornament. So why ornament? Because ornament is a much-discussed question today, uh, and a lot of theorists and practitioners have mentioned its so-called return. For example, Farshid Mousavi, and my colleague at Harvard, and Michael Kubo have written this book, The Function of Ornament. This return is very often linked to the rise of digital culture, but in ways that are not always clear. And above all, and this is what I'd like to discuss mainly today, what is today called ornament is very often very different from what we used to know uh, about ornaments. The relation between today and the past is not always evident, so to what extent is it a return? To what extent is it something new? So what I intend to follow is actually two things, uh, two tracks. Uh, the first has to do with the relation between ornament and subjectivity. I will argue that one of the strong continuities between yesterday and today might be the question of the subject of architecture. To for whom is architecture uh, meant, for, uh, is perhaps uh, one of the uh, dimensions that, that link the present and the past. And the second might be the political dimension, and I'll try to explain that also. So what I'm proposing to do is uh, first to begin by what's happening today with a so-called return of the ornamental, and try to show how different what we call ornament today is from what we used to call ornament in the past, let's say basically from the Renaissance to the end of the 19th century. So that will lead me to the question, you know, in what sense is it a return? And then I'll try to characterize also ornament as something that had a link with subjectivity and uh, the question of the human subject, and as I will try to show, there are various subjects involved in the question of ornament. And what is happening today may have to do with actually a return of the question of subjectivity. So that will be one of the thread. Second thread I will follow perhaps a bit more short, uh, in a bit more shortly will be the question of the political. Ornament is actually something that was linked to politics and why what we might want to recover today is this kind of political dimension of ornament. So these will be two moments in which I will go back in the past, one on subjectivity, the second on politics, and then I return to the present and try to discuss what's happening today, the return of the subjective dimension, and uh, finally a few open questions on the d political dimension uh, that will lead me to the conclusion. So that's basically the program that I'm going to try to follow. But once again, it's very much a work in process, which means that I have still a lot of open questions on this whole affair. So thank you for, al for allowing me to share that with you tonight. So let's begin by, as I said, the kind of disconcerting return, paradoxical return of ornament. Why is it disconcerting or perhaps uncanny could be a better word because it's both that we feel that there are similarities between what's happening today and, and the past and at the same time there are strong differences so that you know the perspective seems sometimes a bit twisted and that make the between the familiar and the uncanny and this is part of what makes the the problem a bit complicated uh, let's be clear, we seem to have the return of a long repressed range of preoccupation and possibilities, the concern with a certain type of sensory satisfaction linked to the use of patterns, of colors, sometimes of images. Things that were not always absent from modern architecture, but modern architecture most of the time had repudiated the use of ornaments. So, 
we, we are confronted, for example, this is a project by Greg Lean with this kind of pleasure of texture and color. We in a very different genre, probably even more abstract. Here we have Zauberg and Hutton Pharmaceutical Labor Laboratory in Bibrach in Germany. In an other genre, the use of figurative images, but which are repeated like patterns, like here in Herzog and de Meuron, Eberswalde Library, also quite a famous project. So there is something like a return of the ornamental uh, compared to what, yeah, it's, uh, compared to uh, what we were used to not uh, with modernity. But at the same time, and this is, will be really my starting point, what we call today ornament is very different from what used to be ornament. So first, ornament in the traditional sense rarely covered the entire surface of the building. Uh, if you take Baroque ornament, you know, if you take, there are a few exceptions, you know, Latin American Baroque, uh, some South Italian Baroque, but most of the time, if you look, for example, this is a typical Roman church, 17th, 18th century, and you can see ornament is distributed, but is far from covering the entire surface. There is actually a certain degree of scarcity of ornament, which is part of the traditional use of ornament. Most of the time, ornaments were arranged as discrete elements answering each other on a non-ornamented ground, background. So this is something that was still understood by the 19th century and when Formigé, a very, who was to become a prominent architect using iron, designed this project as a student for a station, ornament is also something that is limited on the, the, the facade of the building. This is very different from today, where in many, many cases, ornament represents a pervasive con uh, condition. It actually very often uh, covers the entire facade. It's a pattern that can be repeated, like, for example, here. This is a project by Zaha Hadid for Dubai. Uh, sometimes also, what is ornamental is actually the entire facade, the movement of which appears as a kind of giant ornamental piece. We are, in a, in a way, in the, with this pervasive condition, definitely closer to Islamic ornament and the kind of, uh, you know, proximity between what's happening today and Islamic ornament used for, based, for example, on the use of pattern, of tessellation, has been often outlined. But what I'd like here to discuss is mostly the Western tradition of ornament. So another way to put all that would be to say that ornament is no longer something added locally to something like a skin or a skeleton. Uh, the, this explains another puzzling feature of the concrete architectural scene, uh, basically the fact that what used to be considered as pure structure very often now seem to acquire the presence, a presence more akin to an ornament. Uh, like, for example, the Beijing Stadium, I often proposed that this might be actually some kind of giant ornamental piece. Or, you know, if you look next to this building, you have the swimming center. And, you know, the use of the Voronoi has definitely a kind of ornamental turn. And by the way, it's very striking that Voronoi have a distinctively, in many projects today, a Voronoi distribution, a kind of ornamental turn. So, and so very often today, the ornament is the facade, is all almost sometimes the building. To give a uh, last example, the one that I used for the cover of my book on digital architecture, Scott Cohen's central space, the so-called lightfall of the Tel Aviv Museum, is actually, could be considered as a gigantic ornament inside that time, the building. So, the fact that ornament is not added is actually not a trivial detail. Because since the Romans, at least, and, and it was replayed by the Renaissance and later, ornament was by definition that that was added to the building. In actually, in actually in Roman law, the ornament was a legal category. It, it, it was in between furniture, things that you could move throughout the buildings, and, structu and uh, um, uh, more structural things that uh, could, could not be moved. Ornament was something that was usually fixed to the wall or to the floor or to the ceiling, but something you could detach, theoretically. I'll come back to that a bit later about this possibility. So, one of the reasons I'm, I'm insisting so much 
is that the paradox of ornament in the classical tradition of architecture is that ornament was all the more essential that it was added, which is a kind of thing difficult to understand for us today. The, you know, this added character is still very uh, visible if this is a Sangalo drawing. So the idea that the more super gratuitous added afterwards, etc., was ornament, actually the more essential it was. So to understand that a bit better, we may use a little bit of etymology. Actually, the term ornamentum in Latin has a relation to or order, ordum. They derive from the same origin, as if ornament was that thing that you add to the building that makes more conspicuous the fundamental order. As if actually the, as the ornament was pointing toward the inherent order of things. So we can go back also to Greek and to these very strange things, which is that cosmetics, one, you could say that ornament is a little bit like cosmetics, like the makeup of a facade. But, but actually, cosmetics has a link with cosmos. There again, with the idea of an underlying order. So in some ways, and you know, Derrida has written a few pages on this question of, the, of ornament as a supplement, what he calls a supplement that is actually pointing towards something that is definitely not added something that is essential. Or the traditional regime of ornament is that it's something added that is essential. A little bit like architecture more generally. Architecture, in the traditional theory of architecture, is something that is not the construction of building itself. It's something added that transfigurates into art what is a heap of brick. Hence, by the way, the prestige also of the traditional story, the traditional apologue of, um, you know, uh, Orpheus playing music and the blocks transforming themselves into frozen music that is architecture. In some ways, ornament was the frozen music of, uh, uh, that was constitutive of architecture. Going back to cosmetics, we could also say that ornament was a little, what, is, what does good makeup do? It's supposed in some ways to reveal who you are really. It's something added, but which should both conceal who you are, because it's a mask, but a mask always conceals who you are and reveals who you are really. This is always the paradox of the mask, and this is a bit what ornament did. So, and this understanding of ornament was still very present in the 19th century when Schinkel, for, uh, yeah, to finish on cosmetics, I've already mentioned that I like the question of hairdressing, given the fact that I'm a bit bald. So uh, let's remember also the relation between the Ionic capital and uh, the hair of the Union women. The idea that there was something, because there is something cosmetic in ornament, but once again, cosmetic is a, kid, is a close parent to cosmos. So something that has to do with the emerging order of things. So uh, in modern terms, if you like to theorize like the digital designer, one could say that ornament was linked to something like an emergence of architecture, if you like, from the stone. So this understanding was still very present in the 19th century. And Schinkel, for example, at the Bauer Academy, when he adds afterwards on a brick frame these terracotta ornaments that you see on the right, you know, this is both added and Schinkel takes the time to precise that ornament is something that should not be considered as less essential as the structure. It's part, actually, of the same movement. But it is because it is added, which is what is complicated. Just like with Sullivan in the Wainwright building in which ornament is added to the frame, but actually the kind of effect of compression, of dynamism that it produces is part of the, uh, is part of the energy of the entire building. And of course, I could have taken the guarantee, which is an pro some probably even better example. So it's, of course, a big difference with today. Because today, in many cases, ornament cannot be subtracted. Ornament is the thing. So all this traditional role of ornament as cosmetics, ornament as you know a kind of superficial addition, is totally geopardized. So in some ways, this is a very different ornament from what we used to know. And uh, this makes it very difficult to understand. To, it's very difficult, actually, because of that, to understand modern ornament in classical terms. Uh, but this is not all. What I'd like to mention also is another question. Uh, that is meaning. 
traditional ornament was linked to, sometimes it represented objects, you know, plants, what, uh, trophies, etc. And very often also, it had a, because of that, it has also a symbolic meaning. So ornament and meaning were linked. And it's very striking that today most people, theorists and practitioners who use ornaments say, oh, ornaments should not have any meaning. Why? Because they, uh, it's about distinguishing itself from postmodernism and the use of abuse and abuse of vernacular symbols or more, sometimes more refined symbols in postmodernism. And sometimes it's true, that's a building in Paris by Manuel Nunez, and it's true that sometimes postmodern architects have pushed it a bit too far. And, you know, and probably it's true that when you see that, you're beginning to wonder whether meaning sometimes is such a great thing. Uh, and of course, speaking of abuse, the 19th century loved allegories, etc. So you might not know what this is. This is actually a proposal for the pediment of the Pavilion of Fleur on the Louvre by Carpeau, which is a great one of the great sculptures of 19th century France, the guy who did the dancing group on the opera. And this is actually imperial France protecting, uh, here you have agriculture, in case you did not recognize it, and here you have science. So of course, you know, should we really go back to that? Maybe a good question. On the other hand, you, let's not forget, however, that most ornament were related to the question of meaning, but in a more discreet way, to questions, for example, of nature. This is a, one of the discreet ornaments of the arcades of the Palais Royal in Paris, which are, relate architecture to the question of nature in a more discreet way. So, to summarize what I just said, if ornament is no longer, you know, something that is added, something that is place a discontinuous moment of the facade, but if ornament is the facade, if ornament is the building, so how does it compare, how can we compare it to what used to be ornament? Second, second question linked to also to, to that, if ornament used to have a meaning, very often linked to symbolic questions, if ornament was often allegorical, an ornament without meaning, which is what a contemporary architect claim to be uh, using, how does it relate to the past? So in other words, how can we relate what's happening today to what used to be ornament? So this is where I'd like to propose the first kind of line of inquiry, which is the question of subjectivity. Because we tend to forget that ornament was inseparable from the question of who is the subject in the production and appreciation of architecture. And there are various dimensions to the subject, to, the, to this question. And I would say that basically we have already two big alternatives. Engineers like to divide things in A and B, so I'll be doing that. A, for, by whom is the ornament produced? And as we will see, this is a bit complicated. But, you know, ornament has a producer. What does ornament say about the person who produces it? And second, ornament is meant for someone who's going to appreciate it. So the for whom is ornament meant is the other dimension. So, and then the interesting question would be what are the relation between the producer of the ornament and the person to whom it's destined is also another interesting question. So let's start by by whom. The first subject, the most evident subject, at least if we're to believe architectural theory, is the designer, the architect. And from the Renaissance on, in most treaties, there is a profound link made between ornaments, the way designers conceive ornaments, and their inner genius, personality, etc. In the 18th century, theorist Jacques-François Blondel tries to convey the, the spirit, the creative spirit, or even the moldings, by comparing them to prof, men's profile. This is the spirit of Scamozzi kind of profile. So the idea, why that? Because the idea is when the designer, when the architect designed the ornament, he expresses something of himself. He expresses his ingenuity, his capacity for creation. With immediately a problem is that architecture has rules. So the architect has to express itself, but what if it expresses too much of itself? 
And this is the problem, for example, of mannerism. When Giuliano Romano does this strange thing, isn't Giuliano Romano expressing too much himself? And that will be also the question about Michelangelo as an architect. This will be an ever-recurring tension about ornament. Ornament is what is supposed to express the proper genius of the architect, but genius can transform itself into something excessive, into something exaggerated. So how do we manage that? And we see that this question of the personality of the designer is central. Uh, interestingly, if we look at the French tradition, the first architect who to leave a treatise, which is very often considered as the founder of you know, Renaissance French architecture, is a guy called Philibert de Lorme. And Philibert de Lorme boasts to have invented ornaments, beginning with a new type of columns with these kind of annular uh, interruptions, uh, which will be used, which he uses, this is what is left of one of the porticos of the castle of the, the palace of the Tuileries in Paris. And he used them at the Tuileries. And by the end of the 18th century, architect Claude Nicolas Ledoux will resurrect this kind of idea at the salt war works of Arquesenon. So this idea of creativity uh, linked to ornament. And interestingly also, Philibert de Lorme is not only the first architect to have left a treatise, he's the first French architect to have left a portrait of himself. And in his treatise, there is the portrait of the architect. The architect as the inventor of ornament. And if we're not totally convinced, then we go to the last page of the treatise, in which we have the good and the bad architect. The bad architect is the guy on your on your left, as you can see, he's blind. He's evolving in a pretty gothic, gloomy kind of settings. And you know, the, the, the earth is there, pretty much no decoration. The good architect on the right is teaching. That's him, you know, that's the good architect with a student. And look at the cornucopia, which is repeated here as an ornament for the architecture. You know, the ornament is one way to mark the possibility to use the resources and the creativity of nature for architecture, which is, by the way, the definition of genius. Genius is a natural disposition to create, so it comes from nature, it uses natural, uh, a kind of natural impulse to create. So this link with the subject will remain with, of course, always this question of where not go too far. And this will be one of the questions of Piranesi, you know, the famous quarrel of Piranesi with Mariette, and Mariette accusing him of using too many ornaments. And of course, with Piranesi, we begin to see that there is something almost pathological in ornamentation. And interestingly, Piranesi is somebody who relates also very clearly this idea that the designer is a producer of ornament. Ornament is something that expresses the subjectivity of the designer. So that will remain throughout uh, the 18th and part of the 19th century. So um, that will be actually a story that will remain pretty late. One of the most disconcerting things ever written by Frank Lloyd Wright about Sullivan is that Sullivan ornament were a proof of the ultimate proof of his genius. And Sullivan and Wright has this weird comment, they were virile ornament. Ornament was supposed to capture all that was energetic and vibrant in Sullivan's architecture. And then we see again how ornament is actually supposed to be a reflection of the deep personality of the designer. So this is the first by whom, the designer. But there is actually very often another person who intervene in the design process, who is the guy who actually produces the ornament, the sculptor, the joiner, whoever produces materially the ornament. And with a raging question from the Renaissance on, what are the relations between the two? Should one limit, how to limit the power of interpretation of the worker? All these questions that will go on and go on throughout the centuries. Here it's a good expression of that. It's uh, the, one of the first dictionary of architecture, actually the first dictionary of architecture, edited, uh, published in France by an architect called Davile, a member of the very official Academy of Architecture. And you see on the right, it's in order to negotiate with a worker. On the right, with shades, shadows, you have the name of the moldings according to theory. And on the left, oops, sorry, the, you have the name of the moldings according to the workers who don't need shadow. 
And it's quite interesting because, for example, you have one thing which is called the gros tort, the torus, and this become the big sausage for the workers. And you have, in, uh, and so in order to produce the ornament, you have to negotiate. Even the vocabulary has to be negotiated. So we begin to see that by whom is actually a complex question. And this is going to become more and more complex in the 19th century because there will be a lot of people interested in by whom is actually materially the ornament produced. And, uh, and among themselves, Ruskin and the School of Thought, which are obsessed by the idea that true ornament is not designed in abstracto. It's produced by the hand. Produced by the hand that carve, that molds, etc. Well, this is the Dean and Woodward Oxford Museum uh, by two Ruskinian architects, and in which the detailing is very important and part of the architectural expression. And for Ruskin himself, what makes a true ornament as an expression of human spirituality is the fact that it's handmade. Also that it's irregular. It's not the regularity of the machine. So why is this question coming so much in the 19th century? Because of mechanization. And actually, in ornament is one of the first thing to be industrialized. You know, the, uh, the building components were not industrialized except ornament in the 19th century. So hence for Ruskin, this importance. And ornament was to be irregular. And one of the traces of ornamentation in 20th century architecture is, for example, to be found in Le Corbusier, the traces of the form work in Le Corbusier, who had received a Ruskinian education in Switzerland, is actually a kind of return of this hand of the worker ornamental power in the uh, mid 20th century. This is the Unité d'Habitation de Marseille. So ornament is produced by either the designer and or the worker, the craftsman, the artisan. And of course, it's a complicated question. What does this express, etc.? So the question will become all the more important in the 19th century that the 19th century begin to think more and more of ornament in anthropological terms. Because ornament seems to reveal the spirit of a society, what it will be called very often the Tidegeist. And you will find that when Zemper compares the Egyptian capital to women hairdressing, hairdressing again, we have something of this kind of anthropological dimension. Why this anthropological dimension? Because the industrial society at its beginning is a totally obsessed with decoration and ornament society. And let me remind you how the 19th century de decorated everything. Everything was ornamented. Which led to the question also, what is the relation between this overall ornamental sprawl and the kind of natural tendency of man to be ornamenting? For example, when you were kids, for those, not the digital generation, but the others, when you were really, really bored and you were doing little drawings in the margin of your papers. You know, there is something almost pulsional, a kind of like a pulsion of ornament. And the 19th century is really interested in this question, ornament as a pulsion. What does it reveal in the way, not only about a kind of human anthropology, but humans, the depth of human psyche? So there again, subjectivity at another level. And as I say, this is all the more important that ornament becomes more and more prefabricated. This is a house in the southwest of France, and these are actually caryatides in terracotta that you can buy on a catalog. And it's very common in the 19th century. And so the question of how does it still relate to human psyche? What are the relation to industrialization? What if industrialization was a kind of global pulsion toward ornament? All these questions loom uh, throughout the 19th century. So to finish on that, it's interesting to note that the rejection of ornament by modernity will be initially inheriting the subjective character. You know, when, for example, in the famous ornament as crime of Loos, actually Loos based itself on Lombroso, who was a criminologist, and Lombroso who'd made studies about the use of ornament by criminals. And among other things, tattoos, but also what was called by Lombroso criminal potteries, which were things that criminals sketched on their pots, jugs, etc., with the idea that, you know, the risk of ornament is that there is something childish and criminal, or perhaps even worse, female and criminal, in the use of ornament. If you reread laws, this is very much what is at stake. There is a wonderful article um, 
uh, by two scholars on this question, uh, in which you discover that ornament, the problem of ornament was that it was so much linked to subjectivity that if you wanted to promote a modern individual, you had to get rid of ornament, which was more and more seen as barbarian or childish. So, just to argue in some ways that throughout the history of architecture, from the Renaissance to the end of the 19th century, from the Renaissance and the rediscovery of antique ornaments to their ultimate condemnation by Lowe's, ornament was intimately linked to the question of the subject, the subject that produces ornament, what it means to be ornamental, to want to produce ornament. Okay? Now there is another subject of category of subject of ornament, which are the people to whom ornament is destined. And of course, with this question that ornament is supposed to say something about the owner of the building which is ornamented, of the room in which he lives, etc., etc. And by the way, uh, this is the castle of Vaux-le-Vicomte by Fouquet, the prime minister of uh, Louis XIV when he was still young. And the real problem of Fouquet is not really actually that he builds a big castle. There have been big castles built by minister before. But the type of ornament is royal. And it's interesting that if you go to Versailles, look at the bust, etc., uh, on the consoles, and if you look at Versailles, actually what Louis XIV will immediately emulate from Fouquet, because this is supposed to be royal, is actually the decor. Because the de and ornaments say something about the owner, and in the classical theory of architecture, do not forget that there is this notion in French, it's called convenance, convenience, which is the adaptation of the decoration to the rank of the owner. Somebody of a certain status in life should not have ornaments that are belong to another. Which is, by the way, something which is linked always to the idea that the ornament in your room are linked to the ornament of your mind. And, uh, and uh, you know, we still speak of the ornament of the mind sometimes, and there was supposed to be a link between that. And things about all these things, they will become more and more complicated throughout the, the century. For example, at the end of the 17th century appears a debate on the nature of interior ornaments. You know, could the interior ornaments be different than the exterior? An ornament will be linked also to the rising sphere of the private sphere. And for example, you know, a lot of studies have been devoted to Rococo ornament and then gendered nature. This is the Palais Soubise in Paris, which is an apartment for a woman. And, with, and the Rococo is a gendered kind of decoration. The by whom, knowing that the by whom, it's not only the client, but it's also the passerby sometimes. So what is the relation between the client and the, the layman or woman who just go by the ornamented facade? So this is why the interior becomes crucial, because the interior might be where the subjectivity of the client can fully express itself outside the classical rules of a society. So, which is, you know, from the 18th century on, this link between ornament and intimacy will go on. Which explains then, if we go into the 19th century, the kind of folly of interior ornament that some people will display, like John Soane. If you look at the facade, which is almost deprived of any ornament, and then the entire interior is a gigantic collection of ornament, fragments from antiquity, etc., which are all transformed into a collection of ornaments. Or less known, uh, sorry for the bad quality, it's the exotic writer Pierre Loti, uh, who liked to dress as an oriental woman in his intimacy. Uh, yeah, he was a strange, uh, interesting character. And Pierre Loti had an amazing series of arabesques a uh, room in his house that, of, of course, were not from out, for outside people. So ornament for whom is an other question. And then, of course, the question is, what is the relation between the subjectivity of the architect or of the worker and the subjectivity of the client? And with very often the idea that, in some ways, who is the ideal man of, Vit of Vitruvius, of Da Vinci, reading Vitruvius. Is it the, the architect or is it the client? Or is the architect the ideal prototype, for, uh, uh, et cetera? It's a question that will go on. I'll, I'll return to that towards the end. This is a question that you find in the 18th century in the work of Le Creux, et cetera. 
So I hope by now to convince you that subjectivity is really an important dimension of ornament. I hope you all agree, otherwise I missed it. <laughs> but I'm going to pass to the second dimension and be a bit shorter about politics. I'll be a bit shorter, although this is less evident immediately. But let's begin by one of the famous stories of the history of Venice, which is the gondola. And you know, the moment when the Venetian state forbade the use of ornament on gondolas, except for very specific moments and uses, uh, and all the rest had to be black. Why? Because people were decorating too much their gondola, and too much money was going into it. So what the story tells us is that ornament is about wealth, cost. It costs money. It's about power, because of course if people decorate, it's also, and this is what I said about the client in some ways, if people decorate, it's also to ascertain their rank. And it's about communication, because you don't decorate not to be totally unseen. So power, wealth, communication. You have the three fundamental ingredients of politics. A, ch a religion that understood that very well is the Catholic Church. And if you take the Roman, the, the, the baldachin of St. Peter, this is a giant ornament, which has to do with power, clearly, which has to do with wealth, the huge mass of walls, and which has to do with communication. It's supposed to really mark by the end the grave of St. Peter and the legitimacy of the papacy. So we begin to understand a little bit how this triangulation of things confer to ornament a political value. So ornament is linked to who possesses wealth, who exerts power, and who by the end communicates. Uh, there is another political sense also of ornament, which is actually, and this, which is actually, uh, yeah, perhaps to finish on that matter, this enable, by the way, this is a very old thing. In the Romans tradition, for example, ornament is something that is directly linked to power and wealth. And by the, uh, by, with a very strange thing, when you were a Roman, by law, you could sell a house, but you could not sell its ornament if you were an aristocratic family. Why? Because an ornament was the heirloom of the family. It was the capital of the family, if you like. So it was all about the capital, wealth, fame, etc., that your family had acquired. So the Senate prohibited, at the beginning of the empire, the selling of ornament by aristocratic families. By the same token, only the emperor could sell the ornaments of Rome because Rome was to the empire, just like what the house was to the aristocrat, the mansion to the aristocratic family. And only to ornate Rome by looting foreign countries, bringing marbles, putting statues, was part of this politics of ornament. So that Rome became, became like a treasure chest. And actually, the politics of ornament was also accumulation. And strangely, one could say that the Romans had fundamentally a quantitative vision of ornament rather than a qualitative. It was all about amassing ornament and putting them on public display, like here, this is the Forum of Nerva, but very much with this idea of accumulation of wealth and power. There, and this is what Alberti, by the way, this is why Alberti is so mysterious about ornament, because Alberti tries to resurrect this vision of ornament, which, by the way, in Rome, this enabled to understand why in, in the Middle Ages still, you could not sell marbles from Rome without the approval of the Pope, in theory. Because the Pope was the inheritor of the emperor, and if you took an ornament from Rome, you had to ask to the inheritor of the empire. So there is another vision of the Renaissance. Alberti still tries to resurrect the Roman vision, but which is decor, which is the idea that ornament creates an immersive order and for, and uh, this is Barbaro, uh, who, uh, uh, the, one of the mentors of Palladio, who developed this idea that actually ornament is what makes the, the earth inhabitable. In a way, what Barbaro basically tries to explain is there are two unhuman realms that man is exposed to. One is nature, which is totally unhuman, and the other are the gods. And in between the two are history. In between the two, the only way for man to construct a shelter that is livable is actually to ornament his space. Just like if you were in a totally inhospitable hotel room and you put the picture of your kids, whatever, a series of ornaments to make the space livable. 
which is a little bit what even the Teatro Olimpico conveys, this kind of immersive vision. So ornament will remain a political subject for very long, and then you begin to understand why the French tried to create a French order, which is a very weird idea. Here, and by the way, with very modestly uh, comparable in their opinion to the, the, the order of the Temple of Jerusalem, so this is a proposition by the author of the Colonnade of the Louvre, using feather of ostriches in order to reinforce the lightness of the French order. So very strange thing, but a totally political thing, of course, which has to do with power. And then you're ready, in some ways, to understand what the Americans did at Penn Station, where they use a Corinthian order taken from the Caracalla bathhouses of Rome. Why? Because this was the Empire State, and that, you know, it's a kind of public, large room based on the Roman pattern, but for a democracy. But you reuse a kind of imperial ornament. So ornament was coded, and you can decipher a lot of things throughout the history of ornament, linked to a politics of communication very often. So, so this is what I wanted to convey on basically subjectivity and politics. That all clear so far? So let's move back to the present, where it's going to be again very unclear. So what's happening today with this question of ornamentation? I would argue that what has returned in many respects is something very often closer to ornamentation as a practice than ornament as we knew it. But there are, however, in my opinion, uh, a number of continuities if we begin to think of this question of subjectivity. So before that, to go towards that, let's pay attention to a number of, uh, 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 a number of characteristic of contemporary ornament. The first one is tactility. Many ornament today seem to be almost destined to be touched. Even when it's not the case, this is the, the Young Museum, and it's almost looked like you know, the alphabet for the, for the blind. You know, something you had to touch with your finger to fully understand. Ornament seems to be something you should touch to understand today, which is quite different from traditional ornament, which was very often less tactile. Another aspect, this is the picture uh, I sent for the postcard, but is a kind of haptic, almost hypnotic character. You know, why is ornament so often rediscovering a kind of op art kind of techniques in which, in some ways, what seemed to happen, it is as if you know, tactility, you have to touch. Here, you know, with this kind of vertigo of the swirling ornament, it is as if you were attracted by the ornament. So my argument at this stage would be to say that the contrary ornaments seem to go to, to move towards the abolition of the distance, the suppression of the distance between the architectural object and the, the observer as if in some ways the object and its observer were part of the same space, in continuity one with an author. Uh, and it's striking now when one begins to read a little bit what the people who produce this kind of ornament write, it's striking how this is precisely what they try to argue, that you know their architecture is meant to be uh, to be based on the hypothesis of continuity between the subject that perceives it and the, build, and the object. And one term that comes again and again is affect. And the big difference with, between the traditional emotion and affect, emotion is something that separates you from your context because it's eternal. Affect is something, and this is very often taken in the Deleuzean sense, is something that relates you put you in continuity with the object as if the object and you were part of the same environment and as if the affect was a property of this environment, a common property, if you want, between you and the object. So this is very often what's happening today. So of course, behind that, we have the vision of a kind of new subjectivity that is a, a kind of environmental subjectivity in which we're no longer like statues in a world foreign to us, but were rather nexus of concentration of forces and affects which flow through us uh, and relate us to our surroundings. 
uh, a world in which there is nothing like classical substance, but rather events that happen in space and time, a little like what quantum mechanics describe. You know that in quantum mechanics, you don't have objects in the traditional sense. You have functions of presence, probabilities of presence uh, that actually m make an object, a uh, particle always, you know, uh, something that is in continuity with its environment. So this is very much the world that a whole series of philosophers describe today. And then we begin to understand why actually there have been a lineage of thinkers that concrete designers have read or pretended they've read because they're usually difficult. And so usually they pick a couple of things. But there is a great quality of architects. They don't read the text. And when they do, they very often misunderstand what it means. But by the end, they get it right which is kind of strange with architects. So what architect pretended to read Deleuze? Very difficult to read Deleuze. But, they, let's assume, but actually, they got something with Deleuze. The idea that you know, there is no such thing as isolated substance. And the philosophy of Deleuze has been often characterized as a philosophy of continuity. There is no isolated subject. The subject is part of the world. Uh, and they got that. Then they, got, they read Latour. That's a bit easier. And what they understood was precisely this kind of networked individual, the individual as part of a network, as non-separable from a network that comprises all series of other things. So and then they read more recently Peter Sloterdijk. That's in between Latour in terms of difficulty and Deleuze, a bit more difficult than Latour and a bit less difficult than Deleuze, but who, in, by the end, says a little bit the same thing. So a subject that is very different from the traditional subject. Traditional ornament was based on this idea of distance. You contemplated it, and there was a void between you and the object. Contrary ornament is based on the idea that the, uh, the ornament functions a bit like an attractor, something that part of you flows towards the object, and part of the object flows towards you. So that's a bit weird, isn't it? But that's what it is. And that goes with this idea that even inside ourselves, we're like networks. We like a multiplicity of things. So a very different kind of subjectivity from what we used to know, uh, but which uh, is very much, you know, this is an idea actually that been around, you know, even if we leave aside philosophy, cybernetics had the same idea, you know, with people like Gregory Bateson, once again, the ecology of mind. This is what he says, basically. We're not contained within our body. We're in continuity. We're ecologies which uh, comprise our surroundings, or easier to read in some ways, uh, Bill Mitchell, me plus plus, in which you have the same idea. If you want to understand the concrete subject, do not think of it as bounded by his skin, but he extends through spheres of communication. Which explains another thing. So this is a subject that had been already envisaged by later cybernetics, Bateson, etc. And it's a subject that has a number of surprising properties. One is that he's interested in surface. And this is, by the way, where postmodernism and cybernetics met. Remember Lyotard's postmodern condition, in which he explains the, mo the new postmodern subject is interested in surface. And ornament today is about surface. It's about these kind of superficialities that it extends towards you. Another thing is the idea that the, the new subject, more than forms, he perceives patterns, which is where form and information meets. And this is, uh, I'll pass on that, this is where it meets with the old theory of patterns. In many ways, concrete ornament are not forms, they are patterns. That's to say, uh, moments in which information merge with visible organization. So I know this is a bit difficult, but you know, life is difficult and that's like it. That's it. So let's finish on that. The most paradoxical aspect of modern subjectivity is that on the one hand, we're distributed. Take even yourself, you know, you're young, you're distributed within a number of affiliation, password, different identities. You're this on, that, on this network, that on this other network. You are extended through a myriad of communication, etc., etc. You're certainly not reducible to, what, to just a physical body. 
you're an environment. And, and you meet with other environment. And at the same time, you're desperately trying to be yourself as an isolated hero. And think there is one place where you do that constantly, it's Facebook. On Facebook, you're an environment, you're defined by your friend, what happened to you. It's all about being beyond yourself, and you're the superhero of your Facebook page. So let's explain the last aspect of country individuality, which is this constant balancing between you know, spreading around, becoming an environment, and trying to gather together to be again a statue of yourself. And the only way to solve that on a phys phil philosophical standpoint, how to be both deeply individual and to be inseparable from what surrounds you, is actually the Leibnizian solution of the monad. And you know, the big secret in this affair, which is you're not really a substance, you're a point of view on the world. What is your Facebook page? It's a point of view on the world. Your point of view of the world, etc. And in some ways, what does the country ornament suggest to you? That, you know, architecture is the point of view you have on architecture, in some ways. So this is how all that functions in relation to this new and a bit disconcerting at times kind of analysis. So one of the hypotheses I make is what is returning actually very strongly through ornamentation today, and what was Link to ornament, uh, uh, link in the past of ornament with the question of subjectivity. The only big difference is that it's, of course, a very different subject from the subject of classical ages or even the Renaissance. It's this kind of postmodern, cybernetic inspired, uh, monadological subject. By the way, why Deleuze? Because Deleuze is somebody who actually endlessly elaborated on Leibniz monadology. So, uh, that explains why this is where architects are fabulous creatures, because none of them ha was ever clear when reading The Fold by Deleuze, which is really, for the students, by the way, do not pretend you've understood The Fold. It's really difficult. You know, it's really difficult, you know, even for philosophers. So, but actually, even if you don't understand it, you've got very often the substance of it, which is where design is a strange activity. So anyway, probably because architects, when they read something and they don't understand, they imagine what it should be. So, uh, and sometimes they guess it right. So what might be returning is actually a strong connection between architecture and the question of subjectivity through ornament, which is one of the great repressed dimension of modernity for a while. Remember Michael Hayes' demonstration about Hilbert Seimer, how actually modernity tried to replace, to, to, to eradicate humanism at a certain point. And of course it came back already at the end of modernity. Think also Sylvia Levin's demonstration on you know, Neutra. And, no, and there again, you know, who is the subject? Is it the architect or is it the client? And you may, and you know, Sylvia Levin has elaborated on, you know, is the architect a kind of super psychoanalyst of the client? Uh, you know, but uh, this is actually the question of subjectivity is really back. Now there are questions which are unsolved. One of them is the total eradication of this other subject who produced the ornament in the past was the artisan. It's very striking today in digital design, and and very often the, in the ornament is produced by people who couldn't care less about workers artisan, craftsmen, etc. And it's quite striking, by the way, that many of these tectonic uh, digital design things are ornamental, but without workers. And by the way, it's not a hazard, it's supposed to be produced by robots. As if, you know, so strangely, what's happening today is a kind of new Ruskinian discourse in which the architect produces the ornament as an artisan, but he makes the artisan disappear. So, and I think this is one of the greatest problems today with ornamentation, that is trying to get rid of this other, of the ornament production that was the worker. So, that's part of the ambiguity today, and this is not very simple to uh, solve. Other question, is the designer, as the producer of the ornament, exactly the same as the person who experiences the ornament? There again today, the, the digital design discourse is that it's the same. You know, the designer is this generic 
subjective superhero, which is the same as the client. And we have totally eradicated this traditional dimension. So what I would argue is the reason we have so many difficulties actually rediscovering that there are people who produce architecture materially, and there are clients which are different than the ideal architect, is because there is one thing that has not yet returned, which is the political dimension of ornament. Because these distinctions have actually to do with the political dimension of ornament. And in that respect, I think there we've not totally reinvented ornament. And for me, this is linked to another question, which is the fact that ornament was political very often through meaning and symbol, because it was linked to communication. And we have not yet made peace with meaning. And I would argue that in some ways part of it is because we're so afraid of postmodernism. Let's not fall back into that. But guess what? I think postmodernism was right, at least on this issue, that you know, communication matters in architecture. Very strange today, by the way, because Colomina and others say that architecture is media, and the very common discourse, architecture is media. But architecture is not meaning. So what is media without a message? You know, of course you can be a, a primitive McLuhan-esque, you know, the media is the message, but it's not how it works. So we have a problem there. And I think ornament today, the, meaning, the, the lack of meaning of ornament is a problem. And it's even worse because we want to exclude meaning, but as Robert Levitt once remarked, meanings come back by the window. You expel it by the door, and it comes back by the window when Omar does this proposal for Jeddah. Come on, it's not neo-Arabesque. Uh, you know, it's a kind of, it's a kind of worst uh, uh, case scenario of you know, neo-Arabic uh, kind of ornamentation. So in some ways, trying to avoid meaning, we, fire, we fall in the worst kind of use of meaning in architecture. So let's be clear, and I'm almost done. What I'm advocating is not to go back to a kind of proliferation of sign and symbol in the postmodern way, even if there are a few interesting things to take from that. What I'm advocating is actually to ask oneself finally, seriously, what is architecture as a tool of communication. So what is the relation of architecture to political meaning, to institution, etc.? Which is to ask ourselves again, for example, the question of monumentality. We produce monuments today which very often say, hey, I'm not a monument, you know, like Venturi kind of thing. You know, oh, I have no, no meaning. I'm a museum, but, you know, I'm not saying anything. Uh, this is becoming a real problem. So, what I'm advocating is in some way to think a little bit more about the relation between architecture and, and society, architecture and politics. An ornament could be a way to think about those things because historically, ornament has always provided ways to think about politics, institution, etc. The orders, let's not forget, the orders, they are part of their symbolic meaning. For example, you know, the orders had a gender. Doric was masculine, Yannick was female, uh, Corinthian was supposed to be a young girl, Composite was supposed to be a, a young boy. Okay, but it was not only that. You know, Yannick was supposed, for example, to characterize cultural programs. And most museums use the Yannick order. So I don't suggest that we should go back to the Yannick order. But even the use of the order had linked to what we thought about institution, etc., etc. Your museum is actually using a, a Yannick order. Very classical thing, and people knew when they saw a Yonic order, this is not a priori a prison. This is more a museum or something like that. So in some ways what I'm calling for is rethinking again question like monumentality because the modern tried to solve it without ornament, but since ornament is back, we might want to solve it differently. And uh, so the relation to society, and all the more that through digital media, society itself is becoming ornamental. This is not an ornament, actually. It's the density of phone call 
during a Madonna concert in Rome. It's, uh, it's actually a moving map, but since I'm a cautious person, I never use animation in my PowerPoint. Uh, but so actually, you can see actually um, uh, people arrive uh, to Termini by train and they give phone calls. So you have the density of phone calls, then they move to the stadium where Madonna, etc. And so you have this changing surface, very beautiful, like an ornament. So society itself is a kind of ornamental reality today. So we might want to rethink, and this is really what I wanted to convey, that ornament is a very serious issue. And through ornament, it's how is architecture to understand its place in society and to convey, I think part of the question we have today to solve is what is the new kind of democratic society we want when we have this society equipped with all these digital stuff, etc. I think for me, ornament is one of the ways in which we can raise this question. So once again, uh, ornament is a totally ridiculous subject, but it's a really important subject, in my opinion, by the end. And thank you very much. is that you know today with digital fabrication there is a kind of neil ruskinian discourse about you know prototyping and you know almost the trace of my hand through the digital etc but there is the total disappearance of the guy who produces on the ground the thing with the utopia that you know that the architect is going to dialogue only with the machine and you take gramatio and color it's a robot that's fantastic no worker just me and the robot uh, and so that, in some ways, it has an ornamental flavor, but it has actually forgotten the true nature of ornament as a negotiation between all those people who actually produce the ornament. Hmm? Well, the negotiation was constantly there because the architect designed something, but to which you know, for example, an eternal question in architecture until the 19th century was, to what extent do you design the ornaments? With some architect who design everything, you take Garnier for the opera, his practice design everything, you know, even the tiniest detail. And others just said, I want something like that. And the sculptor did his job. So there were a constant, you know, there was a politics of ornament, which was also a negotiation between all those people who actually produce stuff. And actually, if you look at 18th century decor, sometimes, for example, the joiner was very unhappy at the architect, because the architect has designed something he's clearly disliked. So it was, the ornament was part of a battle. So, and I think we are trying, do you have this word to aseptize in English, to, to clean or to try to you know, uh, to sanitize. You know, we are trying to sanitize the problem of ornamentation. And, and I would argue that this is partly because we don't want to look again at the fact that this is political.
argue that and let me be clear on the political dimension I don't think it's about advocating from outside something you know take Schinkel when Schinkel for example designs the Altes Museum and he decides for example that instead of the center temple he's going to use the model of the Stoa which is the peristyle where people that was on the Agora so Schinkel actually makes an architectural choice which clearly means that he wants the building to be public in a certain way and to serve democracy. What I'm advocating is not a return to totally external political cause to architecture. What I'm advocating is to repopulate architectural decision with political momentum. When the same Shinko, you know, uses certain types of ornament, these are political statements. There again, what I'm advocating is not necessarily going back to the worst of the kind of allegory of the French empire, uh, you know, uh, protecting agriculture and science. This is really not what the, the 19th century at its best. But I'm advocating actually, uh, you know, using ornament in a way that makes sense. Not too much sense, if you like. Yes? things though um, that ornaments constantly link to is a style and you know style always reflected epistemology which reflected like a political thinking of the time and now we don't really have that we're actually too individualized if you're talking about you know the Facebookology of how architects are trying to do their individual thing they can't unite on an agenda we have so many agendas do you think maybe then there's a lack of style or too afraid to return to style in like from postmodernism to really confront this lack of politics and architecture I'm not sure we need to return to style to, to be honest, because, you know, Schumacher has made a lot, this is Schumacher's argument in some ways, that we need to return to style. You know, you may imagine other way to regulate architectural expression than style. Once again, I do not, for example, advocate the return to the five orders. Uh, but uh, we may, in my opinion, we may try to be inventive and regulate it by other things than style, because uh, style is, by the end, a very 19th century invention. It's, by the way, interesting that the Baroque period had no distinctive notion of style. And by the end, it could be understood by the 19th century as a style. But, you know, you would have surprised the Baroque, Baroque architect by telling him that he was building in the Baroque style. So, which means that we may very well regulate a profession with other concepts, notions, etc., than style. What is clear, however, where I would rejoin you, is that we probably need to reestablish some kind of rules, which modernity clearly had. You know, modern architecture had a series of rules, you know, with variation, like every rule, et cetera, with no absolute, et cetera. But, you know, there were a few rules. And uh, since we abandoned really modernity, because this is what has happened to you, probably one could argue that Kouras is the last modern and the first non-modern, if you like. But with Kouras is the last truly modern architect in some ways. Now we're beyond that, and it's true that it's a mess. Yes. Because program, by the end, no, we're not so bad on program. There are two answers possible. The pessimistic one is to say, anyway, program is no longer the architect who does it. There is usually a specialized guy who does it. That would be the, the pessimistic. Optimistic is to say that this is not what is going, the, the, the worst problem today. You know, that actually programs, you know, you could argue then then type is a question which goes with the absence of rules. Uh, I would say there is probably more problem with types than programs. 
and type has to do with things like tectonic and ornament. But, but that's my own take, you know. I'm not, I'm not very much, I think globally, if you, if you look at the crisis today, the crisis of relevance of object is not usually their use. It's more, what do they say? Yes, there were two questions, yes? I think two things. First of all, modernity did, however, limit stringently. It never disappeared ornamental. Think of, for example, the marble in, um, in Mies, Barcelona Pavilion, you know. Th there was always some kind of ornamental dimension, but it was repressed, definitely. And that made possible precisely a kind of separation. The architect tried very hard to control the interior, and then the interior evolved because there is actually a demand of ornament. And it's true that if you go to a law firm, yes, you will have the reassuring mahogany, and we're modern, but a bit Victorian, and this is what you expect from law, uh, et cetera. Uh, is it the politics architect may want? It's another question, because architecture, you know, is a proposal about politics. It's not always the mere endorsement. But I do agree that it's a, it's a real question. I think, by the way, you know, one of the reasons architecture is again more popular is because it's more ornamental than in the past. And that people understand a little bit. That in some ways, you know, the principle of pleasure, but a kind of almost material, physical pleasure is back. That's also one of the consequences of tactility. Whereas if you take core heroic age, you know, the Villa Savoie, uh, if you take typically your parents usually to the Villa Savoie, it will be a difficult moment most of the time. You know, a non-architect have problems with some highlights of modernity. They will have less difficulties. For example, you take people at the Villa Savoie, it's difficult. Take people inside the Beinecker Library at Yale, the, you know, the translucent stone, etc. That's ornamental, they will understand. So I think there is demand for ornament. So a lot of architects take laws. He took a number of codes of bourgeois culture and transmuted them. You may imagine, you know, what a great architect could do with a law firm. It's probably still stick to what the law firm wants, you know, you cannot go too crazy. But at the same time, slightly modify and, you know, make a proposal slightly different, which could be also that. alone. 
I think affect alone may be very, very regressive because the world of affect, it's by the end, you know, the embryo in his mother's ball won't. He is totally in a world of effect, and do we want only that? Uh, so that's a problem a little bit. And actually, if you take classical ornament, it had, in my opinion, two very different functions. One was pleasure, and with probably an affective dimension, but another was knowledge. Ornament had a relation to knowledge, because it was telling you something. Even when you put a Yonic capital on a building in the 19th century, it says this is a museum usually, or it says this is something devoted to culture or to the sciences, etc. So it's not only about the pleasure, it's also about knowing, learning something of the destination of the building, etc. And I think we've lost a little bit track of the knowledge aspect. also a little bit more reasoned knowledge, because we cannot be forever, uh, yeah, sorry. In, in that same way, I almost feel that these buildings give great effect, if they have political in itself, because so often in politics, that's no, do not want the conversation or the revolution or the ideas. So let's be honest, I'm against the politics of affect which tells you in some way, be happy. Yeah. Just touching the stuff, you know. Uh, I think it's a bit limited for me. That's, that might be it. That it, of course, you know, there is an implicit politics of half X, which is let's not, as architect, by the end, really mingle with more tricky political questions. So let's be pleasurable without past, without future, without memory, a little bit like uh, uh, the, the lotus flowers that erase your memory in the Odysseus. So that's a little bit the world of affect too. So, uh, you know, for those who've followed my seminar, I have some kind of obsession with the idea that we have to reinvest the field of historical consciousness. I think affect right now goes with a kind of erasure. It's like a sleeping pill. You know, nothing is better than when you're about to sleep. And it's a little bit, yeah. And, uh, If I had a complete solution, I would really, I, I think it goes with rediscovering, for example, I think we need to reinvest the question of the symbolic, for example. What is a symbol in architecture? You know, because it's still very powerful. I've shown you again and again the Eisenman, you know, um, Berlin thing. Why is it so powerful? Because these blocks of concrete evoke the grave, evoke, you know, they're almost figurative, without being figurative. Which is why, for me, it's such an interesting project. By, because they're about to resemble something that we know. Uh, and so, so we might want to reinvest. So for me, that's one of the way. Another way also, why am I interested in Scott Cohen's light fall, despite, you know, uh, despite Scott's many defects, he's a great friend of mine, but he's quite something. Uh, it's because this gigantic ornament you know, although Scott is in some ways not a very political person, but the giant ornament says something about a certain kind of country, uh, more topologically, etc. I think, for example, we might want by the end to think a bit more on the symbolics of topology. Right now, we do as if it has no meaning at all. I think it's not true. So, a few things like that. Yes? I noticed that you only use one house. Mm -hmm. Because I'm European, you know, I, I'm... <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. I agree. No, because basically this is, typi this is a typical European thing, which is very often architects do not build that many private houses. <laughs> I, do, I, 
Huh? Not in Belgium, that's true, but Belgium is not Europe, you know that. <laughs> Yeah, but It's a big house, and actually it could be also, actually I very often say it's the first megastructure, because it's actually a collective building in which thousands of people lived under the same roof. Yeah? thing you could also say that he reinvent you know there is another project which is the, the cemetery of Rossi actually it comes directly and you know the best secret these days is that postmodernism is returning without we even knowing it and in a way it's a kind of postmodern trick but guess what the postmodern were the last to ask this kind of question yes because with what I said in some ways because I think the individuality today if you take the monad the monad is always something problematic because it's a problematic you know it's all about the fact this is what I tried also to convey this morning is that individuality today is constantly challenged by its dissolution so and I think part of what makes individuality today is the possibility of its dissolution into an environment and, but I still think Facebook, for example, I interpret very strongly the social networks because you edit a little bit. For example, you choose the picture you share. And the fundamental you think, of course people comment on your page, etc. What is your fundamental action on Facebook is actually to propose a point of view. When you're saying, for example, I'm sitting on my balcony and I don't know why, you know, some uh, kind of ridiculous thing we write. You know, I remember one Sunday I was, I just, it, it, this is where you realize the power of these networks. This is the time when I still posted things when I was younger. And I posted, I'm working and I'm wondering why. And then I received immediately 50 remarks from colleagues, including a professor at Harvard who was also ill, not working, but on Facebook. 
So tells you a few things. But that's a point of view in the world. And the most strategic decision you make on Facebook is actually which picture do you uh, put and do you share, and which picture also in which you've been tagged you allow to appear on your page, which is really editing a point of view in the world. So, yeah. simple is that ornament is becoming one of the category through which sometimes without even realizing it we relate to the world and we relate to our society what I was just saying it's not that it's an ornament but it looks like an ornament that many things that surround us today look like an ornament because actually ornament is one of the way with which we regulate today our relation to the world I'm not suggesting this is an ornament I'm just suggesting that actually ornament is a mode of reading of the world in some ways which is why ornament could be political because ornament crystallized a kind of episteme if you like when I said ornament is about knowledge ornament had the kind of epistemic implicit dimension which was actually never totally epistemic because of course it's an analogy just like the order the Ionic was not a woman and you know the volutes were not the hair of the woman etc but they were you know the, the the role of ornament is to help us tense the you know weave this very dense network of analogies through which we understand we perceive and understand the world if you like it's a kind of epistemic condition 